Hello, everyone. Welcome to our MAA with Technical Recruiters. Thank you all so much for showing up today. We're excited. My name is Michael. I'm a program manager at Netflix, hence my shirt. And I will let our team introduce themselves as well. Hi, hey everyone. My name is Red. Um, I'm a technical recruiter at OpenAI, um, an artificial general intelligence uh, research and deployment company. Um, I'm very excited to be here con todos. Um, Hoping to have some good dialogue here. Um, previously worked at a couple startups, including uh, Niantic, uh, maker of Pokemon Go, and Thumbtack, um, a platform for pros and people to find each other. Hi, my name is Shimena Cervantes. Super excited to be here. Um, I'm also a technical recruiter at a company called Vouch. Uh, we are a startup that provides other uh, startups business insurance, trying to make that a little bit more seamless um, in a world that uh, has not yet been totally disrupted. Um, started my career in executive um, engineering recruiting, so did a lot of VP of engineering searches uh, before going in-house and have been in-house now for the past couple of years as an internal recruiter. And we're super excited to be here with you all today. So <clears throat> this is an MA with technical recruiters, meaning you can ask us anything. And uh, with that being said, please start dropping in any questions that you might have in the uh, chat function. If anyone is also interested in joining us in the, few, in the rest of this conversation live, please let us know. We'll also add you all in one by one. Uh, hopefully you all have a handful of questions for us. Uh, we have answers, we have advice, but before we actually jump in and, and answer your questions and give you all advice, we wanted to all help you uh, get to know who we are a little bit more. And so we're going to start off with a question going around each of the room. And the first question is, is how did you get into tech recruiting and what do you love about tech recruiting? Whoever wants to start first. Sure, I'll go first. I um, mentioned it very briefly, but I uh, was in college and my mom told me that one of the most underutilized resources is the, the um, careers help that is on your universities. And so I went to the careers page, found an internship with a very vague description around building teams and helping companies, had no idea what recruiting was, um, but they took a chance on me, got an internship and got lucky um, and was hired full time after I finished school. And then uh, had, it was a whirlwind, it was, you know, any around like 2011 to 2013 when tech was really taking off. Um, was excited to learn about companies like Everlane and Warby Parker right at the beginning, um, but also um, seeing how Uber was growing and companies like Twilio. Um, so it was a really exciting experience. Um, doing external recruiting can be really challenging, but you learn a lot, um, especially about the candidate experience. And then after that, uh, decided to try something new and went in-house and now do a lot of hiring for individual contributors and sometimes uh, managers as well. Awesome. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, um, I actually got started in early 2018. I was sort of at a, a crossroads where I was trying to figure out like what I wanted to do that could allow me to like continue meeting new people, like learning from folks. Um, I wanted to get into tech because I don't know, I, I sort of always was into like computers and cutting edge technology and um, kind of as a as a kid that didn't have a lot of money growing up, I think um, it always piqued my curiosity, just like reading about this stuff. So when I moved to the Bay Area, it felt like I was really communities um, and I just basically applied. Uh, and so I, I joined Niantic as a recruiting coordinator um, and kind of uh, kind of started my career there. And I think ultimately it was really fascinating. I myself am not an engineer and I will never be an engineer, most likely. Um, but but it was really cool to like be around so many brilliant people and, and um, humble people that like I could learn from and just continuously like feed that curiosity. Um, and since then, I mean, my career has changed a little bit. You know, I've I've mostly focused on engineering roles, um, but I've gotten a chance to sprinkle in other other kind of groups like communications or business operations, um, even people roles like other recruiters and HR professionals. So. Um, it's been super rewarding, and I think every company has its own, like, I don't know, sort of mission and goals. And, and I think as recruiters, we really get to, like, adapt to that over time, and it keeps us flexible, it keeps us growing. And so 
Um, for me, it's hard to think about a, a different career path. This, this feels like it for me. Awesome. Same here. One thing that I always remind myself is recruiters, tech recruiters, we have an opportunity to really help change folks' lives, get them new jobs, sometimes really help elevate their compensation, help get them involved in a better company culture. So uh, I think that's one of the great things that we get to do as tech recruiters. Uh, I'll, I'll also answer the question to help you all get to know who I am. Uh, it's a fun question for me because I actually, um, in recruiting, there is this saying that no one went into college and studied recruiting or no one went to college to become a recruiter. Uh, but I actually think that I did. Um, so my senior year in college, I was a recruiter at a nonprofit organization that partnered with our college. I went to University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. And so I got that kind of taste around what a recruiter was my senior year in college. And so right after college, I got into um, agency recruiting. I was at Tech Systems, um, tech recruiting there. And then I went, went to Uber and then Netflix. Um, and so that's how I got into tech recruiting, where it's essentially it started off um, within college. And the next question we're going to go around and answer the room before we hop into yours, the last question I promise is, what is one thing you are celebrating during this Latinx Heritage Month? I'll pick on red first this time. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've sort of been on this mission the last few years to just like better understand my personal heritage and and you know my family is uh basically all from mexico and i, and I think like um I, even though i've visited in the past like i don't have very i don't feel like i have very deep roots either in knowledge or like family there now and so i don't know we were talking a little bit like as you get older you want to know more about your past as much as you think about your future um so for me i've, I've kind of made it a mission to think more and learn more about uh, queer culture and the kind of intersection of, of queer folks in, in Mexico specifically. Um, so that's a little bit about what I've been thinking about and, and trying to learn more about. Like there's some really good YouTube videos and obviously lots of books and um, kind of history to read from. But, but yeah, that's been that's been a kind of top of mind for me lately. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, Jimena? mine is similar, uh, very similar to Red's. Um, I don't have a whole lot of family in Mexico anymore, even though both sides of my family um, has heritage there. And I, uh, to be transparent, I'm also not a Spanish speaker. And so I've always struggled with finding my own identity in the Latinx community. And I've really, over the past couple of years, really been trying to get reconnected. Um, I love traveling through Mexico and the best way that I am able to connect is through food. So there's a lot of really great Netflix shows, uh, like the Taco Chronicles just came out with a season two, um, but also learning as much as I can from my dad. Um, he is a master, but uh, not always willing to teach his secrets. So I'm, I'm trying to get uh, trying to get as many recipes as possible. Thanks for sharing. I am. I also agree with you both similarly. Um, and so I actually just found out yesterday that I'm considered a retro Latino. Um, so. At Netflix, we brought in an external guest speaker for this Latinx Heritage Month. And uh, Retro Latino is essentially someone who grew up without any Latinx culture. I also do not speak Spanish fluently. And so I've kind of taught myself everything that I know about being Latinx and kind of molding what I want to be and, and what I think um, my Latinx story is. Similar to Red, I think it's very important to also add in other aspects of my identity. I'm also gay. And so when I add in gay and Latinx, it's a very unique Latinx experience. And I'm trying to build what that is for myself as well. So thank you all for sharing. Hopefully everyone got to learn a little bit more about who we are. Um, and so with that being said, let's hop into some questions. I, I see a question first from Sandra Pinto. So we'll just read it out and um, whoever wants answered or we could also popcorn around. So hello everyone, I'm a career changer going from accounting finance into data science with a master's in data science. What can you recommend to career changers? I'll do my best to answer this. Um, one of the opportunities that I had in my career was to work at Hackbright, which is an engineering bootcamp for women, which is predominantly people who are going through career changes. Um, and I actually am going to reflect on one of the, the talks um, that was happening a little bit earlier around navigating your job search. And just to mention that um, the host there said that 80% of your job search is networking. And I agree with her, especially for people who are going through 
those um, career transitions. I think that um, this, the, the technical community um, can be really network driven and as much as possible to try, even while you're in school to start building that network. Like it's already great that you're here. Um, definitely uh, join the Techedia Slack channel if you haven't already. Um, start trying to meet people there, even if it's casual coffees. Um, I think as well, connecting with people on LinkedIn who have maybe similar backgrounds to yourself or have also gone through that career transition, just so you can start learning what are the specific tactics um, that worked for them during their job searches and also to start um, getting to know some of the people in the community. Um, I think this could give you access to potential job opportunities before they open, um, get you access to people who maybe you wouldn't have connected with um, if you didn't know that this community existed. Um, yeah, I think that is like super valid advice, especially when you think about just how networking plays a part in knowing what jobs are open, you know, like who's doing, who's doing what, where. Um, I will say also like, you know, realistically, COVID has really thrown a lot of business practices uh, around for a loop. And it's tough to do a career change at any point in time. And I think it's particularly tough for some folks now. Um, so I do want to start off by saying, like, do not lose hope or, or progress. Um, you will you will make it. That is for sure. Um, but tactically speaking, I think one of the things that can help is knowing what types of companies are hiring and what they're looking for. So as much as you know what skills you bring to the table, you should certainly spend time becoming aware of, of what others are looking for. So, um, you know, even if it's companies you're not particularly interested in, you might notice a trend like, oh, this company is really emphasizing Python knowledge or using R or SQL. You know, like if, if you're seeing that, if you're not ready for that type of stuff, be ready because most likely it'll be asked during interviews. Um, but, but that's kind of my take. Um, I also sometimes recommend setting up alerts like if you're not really sure where to apply, set up a Google or, or LinkedIn alert and so that you know when jobs are coming up. Um, certainly, back to Shimena's point though, like leverage your network um, and build it out. <laughs> I'm going to add to that. I absolutely agree with what Red is saying. And I think if you're also new to tech, look beyond the companies you know the names of, right? All of us know the Fang companies, right? So. Um, I mean, Michael, you're at Netflix, but look beyond what you think is out there. There are so many tech communities that or tech companies that exist. You might just not be familiar with them. I think AngelList can be a really great resource or even looking at Crunchbase to see like, okay, what's the top 100 um, companies that are focused on, on data science could be interesting. Um, and if you're in data science, right, you, you probably are familiar with Boolean. You can really utilize Boolean searching for jobs in Google, which can be an interesting way to populate companies you wouldn't have seen before. So definitely there's just so much out there. And um, just like what Red said, you know, maybe think, um, be a little bit creative, especially when you're starting your job search. A company might not seem super interesting, right? Like business insurance might not be the coolest thing in the world to everyone, but what are the other types of things that are really gonna be important to you, right? Whether a company cares about diversity or work-life balance or team collaboration, mentorship. There's a lot of other things that can be really valuable to you. I agree. I actually have nothing to add on because Red and Shimena said everything that I was going to say. So amazing. We will go into another question that I'm going to read it from the chat. But if anyone does want to live, please click on your option to join us live and we will add you in. But the next question I think is going to be a juicy one. Uh, so every time, it's from Carlos Diaz, every time I've been invited to an interview, I've made it to the final round, but I've gotten a ton of rejections. What are the biggest factors in deciding to invite someone to interview? And what are things that make you say no to a candidate? So I'm, I'm curious how the two of you are thinking, but I, I do feel like a lot of, a lot of what a recruiter might say is it depends. Right. So I don't know enough about your background, about the companies um, to maybe give like a thorough assessment. I would also want to know um, if you've been asking for feedback, if the companies have given them, are you seeing any sort of trend? You know, um, whether it is uh, maybe you're a software engineer and a company is looking for a certain level of business acumen from the people that they're bringing in or if they keep sort of 
giving the excuse around seniority. I would be curious to know um, if there's any sort of theme that you're seeing and then specifically trying to focus on um, improving yourself in those areas. Um, but I'll, I guess I'll, I'll throw the question back to Michael. I'll take a, <clears throat> I'll take an attempt as well. Uh, and so in terms of what are the biggest factors in deciding to invite someone to interview, um, for one, for me and the, the roles that I use to support um, at Netflix is we want to see uh, two things, a role fit and a value fit. And so uh, value fit is, is uh, companies also refer to as culture fit, but we are moving away from a culture fit because a culture fit can mean very different things in many companies. But for us, it's more of a value fit. And so if we see that somebody does have a potential role fit, a background, um, and there's, and we want to learn more, we're going to continue interviewing you until we find information or, or find aspects that maybe you're not the candidate we're looking for at this point. Now, essentially, we just want to learn more about a candidate. Um, and then what are things that make us say no? It's going to be a handful of things. Uh, but for us, it's an equal amount of a role fit and a value fit or soft skills. However, we will lean into both areas. Um, we don't need someone to be the best of the best at everything. Also is we want to see some aptitude. We want to see are these soft skills or values that are they missing? Can they be coached or can they not be coached? Um, so those are some things that come to mind for me. Yeah, I think um, one thing to keep in mind, especially when you're thinking about like the interview process, as recruiters, we're, we're trying to be your partner as the candidate, right, through the process. and help you understand like what's expected, what we're measuring. Um, and so certainly like feel feel like confident that investing in that relationship is going to help through the process. It may not end with an offer, but hopefully you've gained a, a new kind of piece of experience or knowledge about that company through that. Um, your hiring manager is ultimately the, the group, uh, the person making the decision. And sometimes it's a kind of a group based thing, but there's usually one person saying like, this is the right person for this role at this time. Um, you have to keep in mind that depending on the job, like if you're looking to hire one person and you get, you know, 500 applicants or more, um, you know, it is sort of a, a bit of a competitiveness factor and it's not always um, fair in nature because interviewing and hiring isn't always the most fair process. But, but assuming it is as fair as possible, that means that um, potentially another candidate just had uh, slightly more experience in the problems that they're trying to solve. And so you have to think about it, if you were the hiring manager and you were presented with several options, what would you pick and why, right? Um, you know, you're gonna try and select the person that feels most likely to be successful and to help solve those problems, um, like today, right? And I think there's something you said about like, how do you invest in people for the future as well? And that's certainly like a, a, a very big topic, but a very important one. Um, I will say that sometimes, uh, you know, people say no, ultimately, especially later in, in stages, um, surely because of the experience match. Um, but sometimes hiring managers also have to consider like how this person might mesh with the team, right? What are they bringing to the table? Um, I have seen candidates who by all intents and purposes are well qualified, but maybe they're extremely rude during the process, or maybe they make derogatory comments. That certainly happens because people are people. And so um, I don't think, you know, I don't think you should be like thinking about that constantly, but certainly like you're going to be a team player. What, what are you, how are you going to interact with the team? Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a reason that doesn't always come up, but, but can. And was anyone at the hacking the job search talk? There's a lot of people here, but I wonder if anyone was there. Okay. Yeah. A couple people. Um, again, just reflecting on what she was mentioning is it's not always necessarily about the candidate. Sometimes it is about other um, things that are happening at the business, whether um, especially when COVID was hitting, maybe there was hiring freezes or um, layoffs that were happening. Maybe the scope of the role changed. Um, the team needed to continue calibrating. Maybe you were part of that first round of interviews and they realized, oh, we thought we needed this thing, but turns out we actually need something else. So there are sometimes factors that are outside of, um, of what you presented that might impact why you got rejected. And just real quick, I think someone else up in the comments mentioned that they don't always get feedback. Um, one of the things, one of the reasons why you might not get feedback is because the team, uh, the recruiting team might be concerned about liability. So you can always offer like, hey, I'd be happy to jump on a call and exchange feedback so that there's no 
Um, so there's nothing written possibly, it, not necessarily a concern of mine, but I've definitely heard of it um, in the recruiting community. So that could also be an option and, and potentially get the recruiter, um, give them the opportunity to give you feedback as well. I want to add two things as well. One, Shimena, is around feedback is, yes, ask for feedback. Uh, myself, um, I prefer to have feedback on a phone call versus writing it out in an email. A lot of the time, if it's technical roles, this feedback is technical. And so I am trying to translate what I have got also and, and, and relay it to you. Um, so in terms of feedback, if you're really interested in feedback, literally email the recruiter, email the hiring manager and be like, hey, can we set up a time to chat about feedback? and do not expect it to be an email um, if you truly want really concrete, tangible feedback to walk away from. And then the next is, um, I, always remind, I always remind my friends this, I'm not candidates, uh, but when you think about building a team, as Red mentioned, there is a lot that recruiters and hiring managers need to think of. And when you think about a team, sometimes you only have one person they can add on to that team. So they do want that person to possess these different skills that they're looking for. And they also potentially might want that one person to also bring something that is different than, than is what on their current team today. So maybe they might need someone who is a little bit more outspoken. Maybe they might need someone who is very strong organizational skills. It, it's going to look very, very different. The next thing that I also um, always in, uh, kind of nudge folks to keep in mind is there is a lot that happens internally as well, internal transfers. So maybe you could be the best person for that role, but there's also somebody else internally inside of that company who is interested in internal mobility. And a lot of times companies are going to want to move forward and really help uh, keep internal mobility active inside of a company. And so long story short, I think there is also a lot of things that come into hiring and building teams outside of just one candidate interviewing externally. And so we're going to go on to another question. Uh, it's a fun question. I'm going to two prong it. Uh, Shimena and Red, do you prefer resumes or LinkedIn's? And what do you look for when you look at resumes and LinkedIn's? Okay, I have a preference. Um, so I, I can start. So um, the reason why I prefer LinkedIn is because it's uniform. I know exactly where to find everything I need. So there are definitely times in which I'm looking through resumes. Um, the formatting might be a little off or for some reason I can't find the information I need. So I'll click into their LinkedIn. Um, so I, I think it's more, um, it sort of reflects back on the idea that recruiters look at resumes very quickly, maybe 30 seconds or less or, or a little bit more than that. And LinkedIn, I just know exactly where to find everything. Um, so LinkedIn, Right, but um, resumes also provide a lot of insight that sometimes LinkedIn's are missing, especially for technical candidates. Um, when it comes to what I'm actually looking for, uh, of course, it depends on the type of role. Um, if we're talking about software engineering, like uh, Red mentioned earlier, um, even though we have a lot of technical conversations, we get to talk to a lot of software engineers, it doesn't mean that we are engineers ourselves. And so we have, or at least I have a a um, certain level of understanding of what someone is doing. So, um, sorry, I was looking at some of the comments. Um, so I have a I have a frame of reference of what someone is doing, and so um, in general, what I'm looking for sometimes might be more specific in terms of the language. Right? We sometimes have roles in which we need a very specific language that someone is working on, or sometimes it matters uh, what they're actually working on. So I'll actually go through and read the description of the work that they've been focused on. So it depends on what we're hiring for. Um, again, right there, there is that it depends um, type of section. I think one of the questions earlier was someone was asking about if they should put skills on their resumes. And it's just a really easy way for us to know what technologies have you been working with right there at the top rather than having to read through a lot of text. Um, and I think someone also mentioned um, uh, GitHub's for reference. I actually do look at GitHub's again if I'm a little confused on what technology someone has been working with, maybe it's not super clear, I'll click into their GitHub and say, oh, okay, I can see here that it looks like over the past couple of years, they've been focusing on, on X area. So um, really, I mean, I think recruiters try and use as many tools as possible to get a good insight into um, what you'll bring to the table. Um, I certainly, yeah, I, I guess to that point, yeah. um, I don't think there's a hard and like preference, right? I think it depends. like. Certainly, I think it makes sense to kind of keep both up to date because if you're applying for a job, you might need to be sending in your resume somewhere. But if recruiters or you know talent teams are looking through LinkedIn networks, um, 
then yeah, having your profile up to date there with details uh, is how they're going to get that information. Maybe they'll ask you for your resume later. Um, I certainly look at both. So if someone applies to a job um, here, for example, um, and they link their LinkedIn, I read the resume and I go to LinkedIn. Sometimes you might have, um, you know, unique experiences that aren't reflected on your resume, um, or you might have posted something that is of particular interest or relevancy to the role or to the team. Um, so it's good for us. We, we try as recruiters to create a holistic picture of who someone is with limited data, right? And so the more data you're able to offer, the better idea we have of, okay, this person may be a match to this role or this job here. Um, yeah, so I guess the short and sweet is is maybe think about both and how each one plays a factor depending on the on the interviewing process. I'll also add in my perspective. Uh, I'm a big LinkedIn guy. I think LinkedIn tells a great story. Um, everything from bio to as much details. Um, it also can be, even tell more around, um, you know, your educational background, um, helping folks. I think it's always impressive when I see non-traditional backgrounds of them in engineering. And that really tells a story and that makes you unique as a candidate when I see you maybe studied something different than computer science or you didn't even go to college or you went into a boot camp as she might have mentioned. I think it really tells a story. The next is, I think it really helps um, identify folks as well. Let's just be real, this industry and where we're going, uh, we need to increase representation at every company for race and ethnicity, and specifically Latinx. And so I think on a, on a LinkedIn, you can really self-identify who you are and where that needs you're part of. Um, I have that I speak Spanish on my profile. I have that I'm gay on my profile. I think that really helps tell who I am as well. So you could add Spanish, you could add Portuguese, you could add Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, you could add Taqueria, et cetera. These are all indicators that also helps companies and folks learn more about who you are as well. And so with that being said, I did send a ping into the chat room. We are going to invite one person to join us. And we're gonna start off with Orlando. And we are joining him now. Let's see. I think Orlando left. Okay, we're Alicia. We are trying. Orlando, Alicia, are you all around? Should we try another? Yeah, let's find another question. Uh, from the chat, we are going to answer Patricia's question. Normally, what makes a candidate stand out to you? Um, I can just say, you know, stand out, I guess, from the perspective of a job is just how relevant, how closely connected their skills and experience are to the job we're trying to fill, right? So um, I would love to say that it's like a lot of unique personal aspects, but you know, ultimately like we're hiring someone because there's a business need, right? And so the more, and it kind of goes back to the idea of like the more information we have about you, the easier it is to decide or understand if, if that's a relevant match to you. Um, so I would say like, you know, technical skills, like what languages are we looking for someone to either know or be able to pick up quickly? Um, what kind of experiences, either projects or, or um, you know, being like a tech lead on something at a previous organization, like anything that can tell us that you're a match. Um, yeah, I think those are the standouts to me, honestly, like it really is just focus on blending and matching what you do, what you've done to what we're looking and needing for. So. Um, so to add to that, I think I have um, maybe two different answers depending on where you are in the process. Of course, what Red said, absolutely true. Um, but I would say if I am, I haven't met you yet, we haven't talked on the phone, I'm just looking at a resume or looking at your LinkedIn, I like to laugh a little bit or be confused in a way that will make me ping my engineers. Like I think someone on a LinkedIn one time mentioned that they had deleted X amount of lines of code. And I went to one of the engineers and said, like, what does this mean? And they said, oh, it's pretty funny. Like, 
meaningful, but I had never, out of all the profiles I've looked at, had never seen someone sort of make a joke about it. And um, ultimately I reached out to them. I can't remember if they replied, but uh, things like that just make me, um, you know, remind me of how uh, excited people can be about the work that they do. There's a motorcycle. Um, so I, I love seeing that when I haven't talked to you yet. Uh, when someone is actually in the process, I would say actual excitement and interest in the company. Um, I know that uh, engineers and people who have technical backgrounds um, can sometimes have a lot of opportunities that are thrown at them when they start the job search. And I really like to see that people who are actually interested in my company. Ours is fairly small. We're only about 50 people. But when someone comes in and they have a genuine interest and in, in to know us, and a lot of times that's reflected on or sometimes we know that they have a certain level of interest based on how many questions or what type of questions they're asking our, the team. That uh, really gets me excited about the candidate. <clears throat> I'll add in preparation. Recruiters and hiring managers know when someone is, is prepared or not. Um, thinking around culture, around the role, around the team. Did you look up on LinkedIn with who you're meeting and come prepared with really customized and personalized questions for those folks, not just like, hey, what does this role do, et cetera, but really get to know with the team, the culture, even call it a few different points from the culture as well. Um, the next, um, in technical interviews, what I always think is impressive and what I hear is um, spending the first 10 minutes really breaking down a problem. That's always what I recommend. Hey, if you're in a technical interview, don't just jump into a problem and start coding and start uh, trying to find a solution. Really spend, if you have an hour interview, spend the first 10 minutes breaking down the problem, asking clarifying questions, collaborating with these interviewers you're working with, because at the end of the day, I believe that Netflix and maybe other companies do not care if you get the correct solution, but they want to see how can you collaborate, how can you communicate with folks that you might be working with in the future. So essentially, really just preparing for the conversations that you'll be having. Um, one thing um, that I, I, I thought about, I wanted to call out, I was reading a resume and um, when I kind of changed chronology just so I don't kind of give it away, uh, but this candidate mentioned that they were number one in a specific technology for the entire New York area in JavaScript um, on um, a particular online um, technology source. And I thought that was really compelling and I was like, whoa, like this person's like number one in New York for this, like I want to chat with that person right away. And so really um, prepare, try to, whether it's a LinkedIn, a resume, really try to customize it as well. This question also kind of overlaps with the one we just answered, but it's from Edwin Estrada. In final rounds of interviews, I have been asked to present on my past projects, but I could see I would bore non-technical interviewers during my highly technical project presentations. When listening to past project presentations, what are recruiters really looking for? I wouldn't say I've been on that part of the interview process myself. And I guess I would wonder with that company, um, what was the intention and what sort of, again, preparation did they give you ahead of time um, to let you know how technical or non-technical it needed to be. Um, so I'm gonna have to step back from that one because I haven't participated in, in that type of interview. Um, I think I'll, I'll add, when, when I think about this, um, I'll remove a little bit of the technical aspects. For example, we are technical recruiters and we are not engineers. Um, I looked at all of our backgrounds, we didn't study computer science. Um, however, um, when I am interviewing folks and I've interviewed folks, I want to know more about what you built. Was it scalable? How many of the end users used it? Did you just build this and leave it or did you build it and maintain it and see it evolve over time? And with that being said, yes, you can talk about JavaScript, you can talk about React, you can talk about HTML, CSS, et cetera. But I think that I really want to know what you built, who are the end users, was it scalable, et cetera, et cetera. Really more about the, the building versus actually the, the in the weeds, technical details. Um, I don't really think that's important. We really want to see like, what have you built, what have you owned, and is it scalable? Yeah, I guess the thing to add, honestly, is just uh, oftentimes I think a lot of these questions uh, can feel very broad, but it's like, you know, 
do you, is this something that you've maybe asked your recruiter and gotten insight from them? Like, hey, what, are, what should I prepare for? Who's like my key audience for this presentation? Why am I doing this presentation? What are you looking to get out of it, right? What do you want to see from me? Um, I think honestly, candidate recruiter relationships are under leveraged sometimes. Uh, and these are the moments when like, it can really count for you because you spend all this time preparing and then you feel like your audience is bored. And, you know, ideally like no one's bored because you're coming in and giving your time to like talk to them, um, but, but maybe so. And so what can you do to give yourself as much as an advantage as possible? Ideally, hopefully your recruiter is very in tune with what they're looking for and therefore they can, they are your, your kind of your, your prep platform. Really. Um, I have certainly sat through a candidate's sped up version of a presentation for a role um, and not necessarily told them exactly what to change or what to do, but just mentioned like, you know, based on what I know we're looking for, these are some of the areas that you may want to consider a little bit more. And I think that was a much better experience for everyone involved versus if they hadn't asked the question. So that's my answer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think mentioned it, Red mentioned it, preparation is so important and it doesn't always need to be you thinking through that, right? The If a recruiter is ever offering a prep call, take it. I've had a lot of people skip the prep calls and um, that's okay, it's their time, but absolutely if they're offering it, do take it. They can give you a lot of insight into um, whether it's the structure, the interviewers that you're talking to, it just gives you the context you need to be successful. And don't be afraid to ask questions, right? Whether um, at any stage of the process, if you need clarifying questions around uh, what is an interviewer looking for or what you should expect from a session, take it. Even if it's a hiring manager screen or um, a, a technical challenge, there is always the opportunity to learn more about what's expected of you. I love that, y'all. Um, I think we're all kind of giving you um, this idea is, uh, I think you should expect more of your recruiters. Recruiters are in charge of really helping increase uh, representation in the company, helping build a company, and really at the forefront of growing that company. So have high expectations. And I think when, whether it's a feedback call, whether it's a prep call, Ask for 15 minutes of the recruiter's time. Um, in my own time, sometimes it's actually taking me more than 15 minutes proofreading an email, a feedback email, whether if I just hop in the call, had a quick five to 15 minute conversation, I could prep that kid and give them feedback from previous interviewers. And so really just try to take a hold of those recruiter's times, but if not even suggest that time as well. We have a, another question, um, it's kind of a fun one. How it's from Jesus. How do you work with a business to provide them market data and make yourself as part of the IT team versus being just some recruiter from HR? Question. Um, I would say participate as much as possible. If you know that there is a engineer or right now an engineering virtual game session asked to be in. I think uh, when you're in recruiting, you have a lot of access to people's calendars. So, and, and try and learn as much as possible. I think that um, engineers are always, or hopefully, I, I don't know, there's different personalities out there, but if you know of a couple of people that want to teach you, um, go ahead and ask them questions. You see something on a resume that's confusing, ask about it, because you are essentially helping them by knowing as much as you can what they're doing. And that's also a really great way to build the relationship, set up a coffee chat. I think that just like what we do externally, recruiters can be doing that internally. A lot of times the relationships that you build with your engineers or your uh, data scientists, designers that you're working with can last a really long time. And I think those are successful recruiters. Like I got really lucky the company I'm at now, I met the team through an engineer I worked at, worked with at a previous company. And that relationship is so valuable to me and those relationships will continue to be really valuable. But I think that you also need to put in the time and, and just uh, sort of force your way in there. Say, hey, can I go to this? Let's grab a coffee. I have X, Y, and Z questions about what, what you do. Um, and it'll, I think it'll give you a good advantage. Mm -hmm. I think to, <clears throat> to add in as well is um, from the recruiting world, uh, I think we can really uh, equip the business with a lot of data from the market around what our companies are hiring today, 
Uh, what events, organizations should we be a part of? For example, Tequeria, hey, I think Netflix should be part of this organization, part of this summit. Um, and so really connecting the dots from the industry back to the company and back to the hiring and back to the business, I think really makes an impact as well. We have um, two, we have one more minute, unfortunately. Wow, time flies when you just answer these questions, don't they? We'll wrap it up with this question for any uh, folks who may be interested, um, but it's from John. Any tip for getting into technical recruiting? Ooh. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about this topic. Um, I think I will say that, um, I don't know, I certainly did not formulate my career to be, you know, a tech recruiter, but I knew that I wanted to, like I mentioned earlier, be involved in people networking. I think probably in today, like tactically speaking, I think, again, like knowing what companies are expecting of technical recruiters and using that as a basis for like what your gaps are, like, you know, if they're saying must be an expert in greenhouse, you know, a recruiting platform, great. Um, I've never used it. What are my resources? Can I go watch videos? Can I ask questions? Right. Um, and, and to Shimena's point from earlier, like network, there are lots of recruiters out there and maybe not everyone has the time or, or even interest to help other people, but there's a large portion that do, um, tap us, ask us how we got into it. Ask us to look at your resume, ask us to do a, a you know, a, a mock interview with you. Um, those are some of my, I guess, kind of opinions there. Yeah. I'd also say, don't be afraid to look into agency recruiting, internal mm -hmm. recruiting. Sometimes you want to see someone with a little bit, like with a couple of years of experience, unless maybe you're open to a coordinating or sourcing type role and you can learn a ton of those, those opportunities. Sometimes, um, this way is to start exploring the agencies that are out there. I will say like uh, it, once you're in them though, they're, they're very, they can be challenging. It's a lot of hustle. You learn a lot, but it's going to be a hugely valuable experience. To add on to what Shimenda mentioned as well is uh, kind of um, my old manager at, in Netflix. Uh, she had a preference for hiring folks who had both who started off in agency recruiting and then moved into an in-house company. Um, and I think having both ends of the spectrum really can make you more of a well-rounded recruiter as well. Um, also, the next is, is you don't have to start off in a recruiter role first. There are many roles in HR and the talent industry that you can then move into recruiting in the future. I also think if you maybe started in, in those areas before hopping into a recruiter role in a house company, it would actually help you learn the basics um, and understand really how to recruit and how recruiting works at different companies as well. Mm -hmm. Well, all that wraps up our session for today. I know there are still a handful of other questions that we weren't able to get to, um, but feel free to reach out and connect with us on LinkedIn, and hopefully we will see you all at the rest of the summit. Any other parting words, Jim and Red? Just um, super happy no to be here. Yeah. Go ahead. But it was just go vote if you can. Um, you know, we are uh, we're a resilient group of people, and and um, and we must continue that for sure. Um, but no, everyone be safe, be happy, be healthy as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Thank you all. Have a good day. Bye, y'all. Adios. Bye.